Hi, I'm Jessica, I'm Director of DIA Art Foundation, and I'm incredibly happy to be back with the Verbier Art Summit for 2021. And, and huge thanks to Anna Week and the team at the summit. Um, so Beatrix Roof, who I know has been working on these discussions for 2021. Um, I plan to introduce the incredible speakers um, that we have today uh, in alphabetical order and to give a bit of background as to why they're being brought together for this continuation of what was the 2020 Verbier Art Summit that was titled Resource Hungry, Our Cultured Landscape and Its Ecological Impact. So following those short introductions, we're going to consider a few questions um, that emerged really from the last summit and hopefully hear a lot more from our participants about their own work and, and thinking. Needless to say, so much has happened since 2020. It's, it's almost hard to compute um, the time between then and now. Most significantly, of course, the horrific toll that COVID-19 has taken and continues to impact us all. And the fact that certainly at least here in the US, um, this impact has been so dis disproportionately affected. Um, the black communities here and communities of color and the poor in ways that are still tragically unfolding. But at the same time, we've also had an incredible outpouring of justified protest and resistance, calling attention to systemic racism and demanding change. And speaking for my own institution, I think we've also experienced a really powerful shift in our thinking, a kind of refocus and centering our attention on people rather than things. And I'm really deeply grateful to the work um, that the community that I have at DIA has been undertaking. So the three women um, that I'm really honored to introduce today are all activists, interpreters, creators, documentarians of our society and environment. And without taking up more time, I'd like to swiftly introduce them and say a few words, words and then of course hear from them about their own work. So Andrea Browers, um, Andrea joined us in Verbier last year and spoke really powerfully about her work to bring attention to activists, those she's championed now and followed for many years Andrea spoke in particular about her environmental work um, with activists like John Quigley and the tree sitting movement in California, as well as her more recent work with Dakota Iron Eyes, a standing Sioux tribe member from South Dakota. So I have always had and continue to have great respect for Andrea's work um, that like Jamila Ribeiro, who was the feminist scholar from Brazil, who also spoke last year with us, um, plays an incredibly important role in writing these underdocumented histories. So Andrea, welcome. Thank you for being with us. And um, I think you're, by way of introduction, you're gonna show a short film. Great. So during COVID, I've been traveling up to Northern California in um, the area where the big redwood trees are. Um, and there have been a group of tree sitters up there have been around for a long time, but this is a new generation of tree sitters. They're called the Redwood Forest Defenders. And um, they're dealing with a company called Green Diamond. It's an area that's been a really famous spot for tree sitters where people, goes back to like the earth birth curse movement. They've been trying to save these trees for this, these forests for a really long time. And recently a company called Green Diamond has been harvesting and they've been clear cutting. And they do it under, they've changed, the way they represent their company and they represent their company as like an environmentally friendly company when in fact they're clear cutting. Clear cutting is a logging practice that removes all the trees from a site. When you clear cut, literally everything is cut down, all of the logs are hauled away and then the area regrows all at the same age. And so the result is a tree plantation. Basically what they do is they cut any tree that they deem to be profitable or in the way. And there are regulations in place that will salvage a, a couple of trees like in this area behind me that I'm looking out at, there's like two or three redwoods that got marked as wildlife. Um, that's what our conservation laws get us is, you know, 100 acres of clear cut, two trees left behind.
I love talking about greenwashing. It's so rampant and it's becoming more so. And I think it's really sinister and dangerous marketing strategy. Greenwashing is the phenomena where corporations lie to us and tell us that things are sustainable when they're really not. And it's a marketing tool they use to increase their profits. So Green Diamond is a subsidiary of Simpson Industries. A lot of the forests that they're cutting now, they've already cut before, but now they have a new name. They've rebranded and Green Diamond, um, the name they adopted several years ago is kind of their effort to like appear to be a sustainable company or to be like looking out for the land. So Green Diamond holds third party certification with the Forest Stewardship Council. And the Forest Stewardship Council started as an entity in conversation with environmental nonprofits that was supposed to hold the timber industry accountable. But what it's turned into is actually just a marketing tool for the timber industry. And if you look at your paper products in your home or your workplace, you'll see the FSC stamp on a lot of it. The more I learn about FSC, the more I think that that FSC is allowing the timber industry to lie to consumers about the real impacts of the products they're buying. And that to me is like a classic example of greenwashing. In theory, it's supposed to hold polluting or e ecocidal industries accountable and inform consumers. But what's actually going on is consumers are being duped and the companies are getting away with murder. And corporations know that uh, that people are beginning to develop like consciousness around the environment. And this has been happening for decades, but right now because climate change is, is threatening life itself so in such a dire way, a lot of people are thinking and talking about this stuff and corporations know that and they know how to milk it and they're responding with all kinds of products. But we know that true solutions and truly what, what is truly environmentally friendly doesn't cost money. Like anything that they're selling us is automatically environmentally destructive and a for-profit capitalist company will never really be looking out for like the land or for the, or for its workers or the or like its consumers you know it's, or the people and something i forgot to mention about fsc is that it's not just like it makes a consumer feel good when they buy it it also garners the company a higher price for that product and that's what's most sinister about it and you see this in the grocery store you see this anywhere you're buying things you see that the things that are supposedly more environmentally responsible or sustainable often cost more money and it makes sense that it would cost it would cost more money to you know grow a tomato with compost than with chemical um, fertilizers especially when the most extractive industries and products are all subsidized by our government but it it feels like a, a very dangerous situation where companies can make money off of branding things as eco-friendly So we had invited Carolina Caicedo to join us in Verbier for the 2020 summit, but sadly she wasn't able to come. So I'm really honored and happy that she's with us here today. Carolina was important to the discussion that we're having then and now for her really remarkable work that has addressed specifically the privatization of resources, loss of biodiversity and environmental justice and works that use a variety of media. Given the proximity of Verbier to the immense Mauvoisin Dam that was built in the 1950s, I was especially interested in hearing Carolina reflect on her project Be Damned, which is an ongoing work since 2012, which has manifested itself in film and performance, books and other media, um, and looks at the privatization of the Magdalena River in Colombia and the communities that have been affected. The work has unfolded over the years, um, and I'm hoping that we might hear a bit more about that, but also the many other works that Carolina has undertaken that address many of the issues that were pertinent to the 2020 summit. So Carolina, welcome, and thank you so much for, for being with us today. Um, so thank you, Jessica, and thank you for the folks at Verbier for inviting me. I'm gonna start by showing a few minutes of this clip called To Stop Being a Threat and To Become a Promise. It is a, um, a two video, a two channel video installation that on one side, the left side has images of um, communities engaged uh, like in collective work, in this case, cooking together. And on the other side, the right side, there's images of probably the, the kind of a different approach to nature, uh, which would 
I call a corporate approach, uh, the approach that builds dams, that channels our rivers, um, or that envisions what I call common goods as resources that are there for our exploitation um, to gain wealth. Um, so I think about my artwork and I think art has the possibility of breaking the kind of authoritarian spell we find ourselves as a society, as humanity. And that's what I wanted a little bit with this video, that the left side with all its color kind of um, threw a visual spell into the right side and started kind of distorting these images um, of corporate nature or of um, man-built or corporate-built structures such as the Hoover Dam in this case, and kind of started distorting them and making them something else, no? Um, I think, you know, art um, has the possibility to, or, or as artists, we have the possibility of doing visual resistance, right? Um, and part of that resistance has to do with breaking that authoritarian spell that, you know, um, corporate images or oppressive, oppressive structures like have right now over us as a society, I think. Um, and in that sense, uh, I think this piece uh, is a recent piece from last year. It's called From the Bottom of the River. It's a uh, hand blown glass with a couple of cast nets over it, kind of trapping it. Um, I was trying to refer to the nature that looks back at us and holds us accountable, but also um, thinking about those entities that look at us from the bottom of the river. You know, if we're going to speak about common goods or what other people call natural resources, if we're going to speak about the environment, I think it's important that we take the non-human epistemologies and the non-human entities also into account. So with this piece from the bottom of the river, I was trying to speak also about those, those entities that look back at you. But in this piece, I was also trying to refer to, well, it's a sad thing for a lot of us in Latin America is all the bodies that have been disposed into rivers and the violence that comes with defending um, you know, uh, natural entities. And unfortunately our rivers, as much as sources of joy, they're also depositories of death, unfortunately. So this piece also speaks about all those ancestors in struggle who are laying down in the river, looking at, at us, uh, up at us, you know. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about this piece too, that's called um, The Collapsing of a Model. Uh, the events of this week here in the United States uh, with the political turmoil, uh, you know, also kind of makes me think that there's a model that's kind of crumbling around us, slowly, slowly, kind of clinging to its power. Um, but um, it also has to do, and I, I think it's not only in, in the political, uh, maybe, the things and events that are surrounding us, but also physically with um, crumbling infrastructure. This idea of collapsing of a model um, also has to do with not only thinking about this infrastructure that's crumbling around us, but what can we do to bring this infrastructure down before it like falls on top of us, right? And kills us straight up. Um, and this was a bit the invitation with this piece to look at this um, view from above, satellite images, of infrastructures that are uh, in danger of collapsing or have collapsed and, and kind of prompt a debate about how can we um, think about deconstructing infrastructures instead of constructing even more and more. And I just wanted to finish with this images, which is a little um, hourglass filled with gold, just to speak about how time is, <laughs> like clicking on us and that it's very eminent that we start taking action um, before, you know, this collapsing of a model really falls on us and doesn't leave us any, any other way to, to get out of the situation. Thank you, Karina. So just jump in and introduce you, Elvira. So Elvira Diangani also is the director of the showroom in London and through her curatorial art historical um, and, and really discursive work has brought attention in particular 
to collective and collaborative practices that explore socially engaged work. I've long appreciated Elvira's commitment to work that maintains a light footprint, whether that's through non-objective practice, performative work, or the current wonderful project that's underway at the showroom now in fluorescence that brings together sound, art, and dialogue. And if you haven't been watching this series, you should go to the showroom's website and, and take a look. Elvira has challenged the norms of institutional spaces and, and given platform to artists who work outside of the conventional gallery realm. And I hope that we'll hear from her today too about her current work and thinking. So thanks so much, Elvira, for joining us again. It's always my pleasure to be in dialogue with you. It was such a great experience with Annalie and the team at Berbier. And so I'm excited to continue some, some of the issues uh, that were highlighted then. Um, I mean, I also love the fact that I'm in the presence of this extraordinary artist. I was so interested when you invite me to consider this because, of course, I have been working with some artists that in, in, uh, that in various, um, let's say, with several different strategies, look at uh, the formula of addressing um, environmental awareness, right? And, and, the, and, the, and a multi-species theory that takes into consideration the non-human collaborators. Um, I thought that was uh, critical uh, to consider also how much of the social landscape, uh, how much of the community we can consider also as an intangible heritage, right? That is, that is there to, to be perished uh, together with an environment that perhaps is surrounded uh, by. And, and I remember at the time we, we had a conversation about the way in which uh, if before, and particularly I'm thinking in the work that Dia produces, no? and the an incredible uh, uh, legacy uh, that is of the certain art forms in, 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 the, in the landscape, in, in nature, and that your, your organization, your institution um, um, take care of. And the way in which perhaps there is a sense in, in some of the artists we work with, uh, Tiesta Gaze, and I have worked with in my career, both within the showroom and outside, uh, now Recetas Urbanas, but also the work of um, Encale, Jacompa, or uh, some of the conversation we are having with artists, uh, Oliver Ressler, right? And his intention to create a recording of some of the most critical issues around the environment from different perspectives. Uh, it was also uh, this sense of how much of, of the, 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 the making of a critical awareness has to do as well with a sense of, um, in, I guess in the name, in the, in the, in the, you say it beautifully, Carolina, I was, I was writing it here, no? like this, this sense of, um, of uh, uh, visual resistance, right? And the way in which um, there is, um, um, for me, also a sense of critical awareness, a, a profound gesture of affection, right? That is built both with the artist's gesture and the people's agency and energy, right? To come together in a sort of extraordinary symbiosis. But there is a sense of, as I was saying, this sense of uh, what, what uh, the possibility of, of creating an active citizenry, the possibility of generating temporary communities around a sense of critical awareness that in my case, I feel it comes in a very specific way, which is political as well as it is aesthetic in the work of artists um, that I feel is important to, um, to, to go back to a sense in which, you know, silent stories or silent communities find, uh, as it happens in, the, in Andrea's uh, beautiful um, documentary, a voice and a platform, right? So this sense of symbiosis, both with the non-human collaborator, but also with those essences, with those worlds, those, uh, as you were saying at the introduction, um, uh, uh, Jessica, no, the underdocumented histories, I think is fundamental for all of us, right? Like I, I think I build most of my programming uh, around certain absences or at least absences from, from, the, from, the, from a certain mainstream. But also perhaps another issue that is important to me and, and here is again a moment where the artist is not necessarily uh, at the at the top of a uh, of an of a pyramid, it is, it is one more in a in a let's say in a collective 
voice and a collective consciousness, but that has the capacity, both in terms of their platform, their voices, your voices, as a, as an institutional platform, but also as we do as in in terms of our institutions, right? As the uh, to give capacity to give platform to uh, these under documented stories, I was thinking a lot about the the, the what you were saying, also uh, Carolina, in terms of the rituals, right? And and how important it was for us to see nature from the perspective of these incredible resource of traditions, right? And I was thinking in how critical it has been during this pandemic for our organization for the first time. And, and I guess for me also to be more courageous than I was uh, before uh, since I joined the, the showroom to reflect on on ourself, but not necessarily as a, as a self-centered discourse, but as we bring together um, let's say the human aspect of what it means to run an organization. And I like to refer to both of your practice in a way uh, from the perspective of generosity, right? Like can dissidents be uh, uh, um, um, almost an act of profound generosity? And, and how important it is that we are self-aware as much as the artist is, as much as the activist is, of our political uh, uh, role, our crucial role as individuals to uh, demand certain action. So some of the words that I, I like to bring forward and I hope that we can discuss about this had that, that sense no? in which affection is something other than just generosity per se is a, is, a, is almost um, a sense of generosity towards oneself, no? preserving this, this planet uh, is, has to do with that. No? Um, I had to say, and this is very parochial perhaps, but I did, you know, walking among trees every day for an hour here in London has saved my sanity <laughs> uh, during these, uh, these several lockdowns. No? And I feel we underestimate the power that nature can have in our spirit. And I feel like this sense of, of like land, water, no, I'm thinking of the Maori community, I'm thinking of, of some uh, First Nations in Canada, thinking about the land being part of one's body uh, that I feel like is something that we can recover, that can we bring back. Thank you so much, Alvera. Wow, so much to, to take from that. Um, I think we're going to come back to a lot of those ideas um, as we continue our discussion. Um, at the end of um, the last summit, and, and again, thank you, Alvera and Andrea, for both being there and again now, um, we, we tried to summarize some of the key questions that, that emerged, um, some of which I think really you, you were just touching on, Alvera. One that resonated across so many talks um, was this need to assess, reassess really our, our spaces, our habits, our structures, systems of culture um, in order to, to think of new ways to operate and to experience. And I think I'd add to that what you were saying, Carolina, that, that um, Elvira picked up on too, which is also finding new myths, new gods, new rituals. Um, and I was wondering maybe Carolina and Elvira, if you could speak to this call for change that has always been part of your practices um, and sort of this aspect of transforming institutions um, through art or through your own work, um, running institutions in Alvira's case, and perhaps maybe um, part of that to think about how the last nine months perhaps have affected um, your sense of these priorities or, or, or not, perhaps it's been a clarification rather than a shift in in focus? I think it's it's important to, you know, when in, in the in the process of reassessing, um, not necessarily to come up with something new, but maybe also to look back, you know, like in, in African philosophy, it's called Sankofa. In in the Andes uh, philosophy, we say we need to look back in order to to move forward. And the answers are there in indigenous and traditional knowledge and practices. Um, it's not that I'm romanticizing that we have to go back to, you know, a prehistory or anything like that. But I think there's a lot of clues in those practices that have been so resilient and that are so important that, you know, continue to be carried into today. 
um, through ancestral knowledge. Um, so, so, you know, that I think it not necessarily has, you know, we have to construct more and more or to come up with new things, but maybe take from what, you know, has been working and adapt it to, you know, this present circumstances, for example. Um, remember, we have to remember, you know, it is in us, it is in us. And I think that extractivism, resource hungry, you know, the, the, what worries me more about extractivist processes is not that they are extracting all these resources, as, as you know, some call it, or these goods, um, but at the end, they're extracting our knowledge to, to you know, as the, our bodies are places for extraction. And we are being extracted at this moment to, um, you know, our knowledge, our what we call maybe embodied knowledge. You know, the the knowledge we carry in our muscles, our memory muscles. Um, we've been extracted of that, so it's about remembering, reconnecting, um, adapting. Um, I would say, for me, that's how I approach it. You know, and I that's what I've been trying to do also. So unlearning too because we have learned through academic patriarchal structures, certain ways, even in the arts, you know, as art practitioners. So it's about unlearning those oppressive structures too. And in that sense, how do we look at nature? How do we represent nature through the art and not through the colonizer gaze that we've been taught through, to, through academy um, or through giving ways of filming or, you know, of, of talking about natural entities. So that's how it's been working for me. And of course, during COVID, um, becoming a mom again, <laughs> giving birth during the pandemic, um, going inside that introspection, connecting to that, you know, I had my baby at home, connecting to that knowledge as woman that we carry, you know, we have the power to nurture we have, that's a power, that's the resistance we have. We continue to nurture and we continue to sustain life, even in the midst of a pandemic. And as artists, we have the power to nurture the soul and to nurture ideas too. So that's a little bit what's been going on for me <laughs> during this pandemic. Um, of course, everything in a very intimate space um, and thinking very much of, you know, if I'm the artist of my block, what is my role in my block? What what can I give to my neighbors as an artist? That's so extraordinary, Carolina, because I feel like there is something about the human, humanness, right? Like there was something, we, we did a project uh, in the public space uh, because it was one of the ways, you know, online uh, and the sort of like the fluid version of the showroom was one and the other was a public space. And, and for me there, I thought, what needs to be here is something that is, I don't know, handwriting, something that can show the human error, something that allowed me to bring the intimacy of the spaces that we all now are captured by into this big screen, into this real state, into this intervention, this interruption of, of advertising in, in Piccadilly circles. But also for us, no, the position, I, and I love that you say like, if I'm the artist of my blog, what is my role? No? Because I feel like for me, it's always context, right? Um, but it also was the fact that I consider with my colleagues and I say, I always work from where I am. This is it, position, orientation. I'm here, this is my moment. This is what I might want to address. And it's not about me, it's about the surrounding, how I bring this context to the conversation. And one thing we did was actually to go to the past and not necessarily to the past of the two years, but as I was saying, in terms of questioning the organization, we went to the past uh, moments of the organization. We, we went back to artists and, and reclaimed some of the conversations that we have with them because we deemed they're so important for the moment, right? And most of the things, interestingly enough, that we recovered were ways in which we could address, you know, like radical curiosity, um, how people were walking, using walking in nature as a way of assuming certain aspects of knowledge, going to ideas on sonic power within fluorescent to try to address knowledges and epistemologies in different ways, right? Try to, to bring back a sense of the aesthetic education 
right? And, and education of the individual from that perspective. Uh, uh, understanding that of course, academy has Oh, and it always will have a lot to offer, but there are ways in which knowledge can be transmitted in other realms. And, and because we didn't have those rituals, whatever domestic or, or actually uh, conforming within an ideology anymore, we needed to reinvent some more. And, and those could maybe you know, bring together a large community, but also bring the four of us or two of us or one uh, on his own. No? So I feel like for me, I'm also a mom, uh, so all those things are, are have been crucial. No, like going back to this sense of being a mom, <laughs> we don't do it as often when we work outside home, and 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 I feel like that there is so the the, the sense of transforming. If there is something that that I think is important and and has to do with this self awareness or awareness as a human of both our input on air, but also our, the incredible potential we have to transform that. It's not over, we can still do a lot. No? Uh, so I feel like the, the, so bringing that to the position of the organization has been also very important. Just to respond quickly also, you know, it, it's interesting what you say. Right now at this point, what is like weaving us together is our vulnerabilities, no? Mm -hmm. And, and, and that's something that we should like deal with and think about. I, you know, I just want to leave it there. Like how we, our vulnerabilities is what is weaving us together at this point, not only because of the pandemic, but because of the, you know, climate emergency we are in, political emergency, um, fascist governments popping up everywhere, you know, so that's interesting to think as a starting point for action, you know, vulnerability as a starting point for action. I was thinking while you were talking, I mean, it, it, that a lot of what you're, it's, a, a, it's about empathy too, no? I mean, this, this capacity to, to encounter our lives in such a different way. The next question picks up on, on something that you've all touched on to some degree as well, but um, two you know, very powerful and memorable talks last year were by Adrian LaHood and Jamila Ribeiro, and they, they were both speaking um, quite specifically to the role of indigenous communities and, and how important and their role is in, in really our capacity to rethink our relationship to the environment, as, as you were touching on already, Carolina. Um, in Australia and Brazil, respectively, the, the sites that they were referring to, they pointed to how much, of course, we can learn from this light touch and a, a holistic thinking um, that, of course, has existed uh, for centuries. So I was wondering, maybe Andrea and Carolina, as you've both um, thought so much about this, I wonder if you can speak to the lessons that you've learned um, in your work where you've been addressing um, indigenous cultures in, in very different ways, of course, and working with, with different groups and individuals. I think that, you know, having made the documentary uh, film with Tokata Iron Eyes, where we went to, which is part of what I showed the year before, we went to five of her favorite sacred sites in, um, South Dakota, one of those sites was the Black Hills. And um, the Black Hills is, you know, one of the most sacred sites for the Lakota peoples. And it also has like, um, you know, it's also, it's, it's like called Custer Park, which is like a horrible violation. So, because, you know, Custer is, responsible for so much of the genocide of indigenous peoples. So it's just horrible. And, you know, to be on, to see Tokata in those native land, native grounds, and then to just see like, we're just hiking and walking by and not understanding how important that land is. Like, I just made me, it was like visceral. And so I started thinking about the land back movement and I started, I took a course with Dr. Caitlin Reed, um, who is, um, you know, uh, writing and speaking about the land back movement. And um, I don't know if people know what that is. So I just thought it was like really important to kind of um, explain there's a, um, you know, that it means the return of all public lands back to indigenous peoples. And um, 
I think that's a really important idea. So, you know, um, in the Black Hills, uh, you know, you have one of the most, it's Mount Rushmore, <laughs> it's there, you know, which is like this giant, horrible portrait, portraits carved into mountains, um, you know, of, uh, of like these kind of white supremacist colonizers. And uh, I think that's one of the sites that's really like at the foreground of the land back movement. And I just wanted to bring that, I don't think that I'm the right person to speak about it really, but I think that, you know, if you just Google land back or um, there's an organization called um, ND, NDN, um, I think, is it .org? Anyway, I think that, uh, I don't know what it is, but I think that, um, it's really important to think about this. And I think it's so, you know, I think we were talking about, I think that part of my, a, a huge part of my work is not only about undertold stories of activists, but I also do think it's about unlearning. You know, I, I think that, you know, the education I got, which was like, uh, you know, public school education just taught me all these lies. And I think it's really important that as artists, we're not at the top of the pyramid. You know, we're part of a collective and part of what we can do is like, like allow people to untell these histories. Carol, Carolina was talking about this and, and tell them in, in more accurate ways because so much of my education is a giant lie. And it's, it's going to take a lifetime to undo that, if not more. Yeah, I think, Touching upon the the uh, the process of land back is really important. Um, there are similar movements happening across Latin America, for example, and probably you heard this from Naine uh, in the past summit. Uh, the idea of demarcación ya, um, so having indigenous people to be able be able to uh, demarcate what is indigenous land in Brazil uh, is is a big movement there. And it is very important that, um, you know, to respect that sovereignty and to give them the land back, basically. <laughs> you know, I totally agree with that. I totally agree with that. Um, if we look at um, the best or the most diverse places on planet Earth, these places are where indigenous peoples live and thrive today and have lived for millennia. You know, they have, uh, you know, it's, it's not debatable. <laughs> it's, it's the fact that they have been the best stewards of these places and they have um, taken care of this biocultural diversity for generations. Um, so I think it's important to acknowledge that and to, you know, as much as, as radical it may sound, to, you know, be behind processes of land back as, as you know, you, Andrea, and uh, other artists and other civil member, civil society members have, have been doing. I think that's an important process, you know, very first, very important step, or maybe a goal, actually. Um, what I've learned of, of indigenous philosophies or, and, or working close to indigenous people is that um, embodied knowledge, I had mentioned it before, embodied knowledge is so important to tap into what we have inherited uh, from our ancestors and we carry with us through memory, through ritual, um, you know, that, is, that allows us to connect to, to place, to locations in very different ways uh, but also allows us to, I, I, how can I say, maybe to perform or not to perform, but to embody knowledge, you know what I mean? It's like, um, you know, knowledge is not what we speak about or what we speak our minds or what is in our art uh, alone, but it's how we carry ourselves, how we act in the everyday context, you know, it's, I think the, the, the biggest learning for me is this consequence that Indigenous life and indigenous philosophy carries within it you know it's this um they do what they say 
you know, in Western society, sometimes we have all these talks, all these summits, all these artworks that are speaking about something, but then we go back to our everyday life. We don't recycle for X or Y reason, or, we, you know, or we're nasty people, you know, you encounter that a lot too, people who, you know, so it's really, how can we, you know, really weave together what we're thinking about, what we're expressing through our work, through our writings, and how can we weave that with our everyday action? I think indigenous life, ancestral ways of life really weave that together, you know, the base of the resistance being the care that we have, the love that we have for that place, that location, you know, that sacred mountain, um, our sacred rivers, um, or the tree that's maybe cleaning a little bit the air of our, you know, or of our block again, you know, um, I think I think that's one of the things I've learned to, to care more deeply about stuff and then to carry this care into my everyday actions. At the end of uh, the 2020 summit, Daniel Maselli from the Swiss Development Agency, SDC, spoke really powerfully about the need for a, um, what he described as a total rethink of our values in order to have any hope in arresting climate change. The last few months have seen increased focus on this need for new models and new institutions that we've been talking about and a, a deep, deep questioning of our values in society. Um, I was wondering, Elvira and Andrea, if perhaps you can speak to the work that you've been engaged in or witnessed um, where you can also identify a hopeful change for the future. I mean, I think that one of the, one of the sort of slogans that I've been working with is um, grief and hope because uh, I felt so much, I've been thinking a lot about eco grief. I think I talked about this the year before, the idea that, you know, every time a species is put on the extinction list or, you know, every time a forest burns, you know, I mean, what has burned in California this last year has been horrific or every time a tree is cut. Um, I, I feel a real sense of grief, but I also see myself immediately pushing past that and kind of ignoring it. And I'm trying not to ignore that grief. And I think that, so I've been really interested in listening to and focusing on youth activists. And I think that that's where we're going to rethink our values, hopefully. I also, and this is maybe not answering your question, I have been very conceptually based artist, just in terms of an artist, and I have been very critical of aesthetics. You know, I've used aesthetics, I think, politically as sort of propaganda, um, you know, to try to get people to change their thinking politically you know, and maybe doing it from a more, I think that art really touches us viscerally, you know, that so embodied, like Carolina was talking about. I believe that there is hope in a lot of these movements, you know, like the movement for black lives, the land back, I think looking at like eco-feminist movement, looking back and looking forward is like really important. And that there are hope, there, there is a lot of hope in those ideas if we can implement them. And so working locally and working, you know, within your local communities, our local communities, and that's all we can really do right now in a lot of ways is maybe also where we find hope to implement these strategies. In my case, uh, I thought of something that you were saying earlier, Andrea and Carolina, and I thought uh, on the idea around empathy, but also what, what one can do uh, in relation to that. And one of the things that I thought that it was important that it came to mind immediately is being consequence, right? Like, like really, there are so much uh, understanding, awareness, knowledge, uh, at time, information, misinformation, right? Like, and, and once we, we are given the tools for the agency, what do we do, right? Like being consequence with that uh, for me is critical. And I had, I had to say like at, at that institutional level, one thing that had kept me going and I'm really excited to be part of, of that is the, the institutional relationship 
which is very intertwined. No? I was almost like writing that it, there is an, es an essence and uh, a possibility. It exists in many ways, but it's also even more in potential and uh, an, an interstitial engagement of both institutions and also communities and let's say non-human collaborators in those surrounding. And, and, and to me, one space in particular that had changed my address of, of what the understanding of community means, what education means, what care means, which is also something that I will bring here, no? like care as, 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 as a drive, as Carolina was saying, of, of the new myth, no? the mythical beginning. Thank you both. And thank you, all three of you. Um, and for taking so much time, I know you've all got many things to go back to, um, families and work. Um, but uh, certainly, I feel like I have many notes and I'm digesting what you said. And um, I think there's so much to take from that. And I'm happy also to bring you together because I think the voices between are, are really the incredible thing with these conversations and um, hopefully there will be more um, between the three of you as well because uh, that that was really uh, very very memorable things brought up welcome to the live q a session of the new york debate my name is annalixi brandy and i'm the founder of the verbia art summit as we only have 10 minutes i will move straight into our panel as we have some interesting questions for you First one is, for all of you, what can the art world do to better support those who are resource challenged? Um, I was about to give the, the word to Jessica, <laughs> which moderated the panel, but if nobody jumps, I'm happy to do so. <laughs> So just to be sure, we have uh, the four panelists here. So Carolina is also here for questions, uh, but we don't see her, but we can hear her. So is there anybody who wants to jump at this question or shall I just move to oh, the Mary, next you one? you want to jump in? <laughs> yes. Well, yes, I mean, I think that, that that is a very pertinent question and, and it's also something that had come out uh, during the, the lockdown. No? Even now that we have this incredible platform, access to these is complicated to some. No? So how we can, in a, in a world that is, uh, uh, let's say, betting no, uh, to the odds uh, and trying to push certain agenda with, with technology, what do we do with the non-technologically savvy? No? And, and I think what we need to do is to create awareness, to continue to use all the analogical system to also send those messages across and use the platform that these other uh, individuals and communities may have to, to bring them to the conversation. I think it's important not to leave anybody behind. Thank you for that. There's a question for Carolina. Now we are experts of change. What is your hope for keeping this momentum at this pace? Hi, everyone. Um, well, I think just to dovetail a little bit what um, Elvira was speaking about, I think if we bring into the conversation and into this momentum people who are in the front lines, people who are actually, you know, um, in the midst of these challenges, I think that's that's a way to to keep the momentum and and um, and that the conversation doesn't just uh, stay in academic or institutional spheres, but actually you know start pouring or start convert like um, having a real conversation with those debates and processes that are happening on the ground. So I think that's for me very important with my art process. Um, I know that for Andrea too, which is to connect to those people on the ground and, and keep those conversations alive and those relationships alive. Know how to foster those relationships and those friendships because at the end, it's about making friendships and it's about committing to those friendships. Thank you. <clears throat> and then the next question is from Sonia Glavas. How can we lift up indigenous knowledge and culture and create solidarity between people worldwide? Another big question, maybe Andrea? 
I mean, I think that's a huge question. I think it's from um, local to the national and international. Um, I think, um, you know, as we talked about before, there's a lot of relearning that has to happen in, in uh, education. I think that um, indigenous peoples need to be put in charge of um, the national parks and lands. I think it's important to give the land back. Um, I think it's just important that they be put in positions of power to have a say over things. And uh, I, I mean, it's a whole structural change. And I think we're starting to go through that now. It's a really long process, but um, there's a lot of unlearning that has to be done and relearning. I also feel like there is a, <clears throat> apart from all those processes, there is an important um, um, to break with certain uh, notions or canons, right? That wouldn't mm -hmm. allow those practices to enter what we call the main uh, academy or the mainstream, right? Like all those forms uh, of art that somehow or experiences that exceed the, the what we what we know as regular, what we know as certain, right? I think uh, the more space we give to uh, the, the knowledge that brings from elsewhere other than the West, which is something that, of course, we have seen since the mid 80s and uh, in, 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 in previous um, moments in the art history, but also uh, so give, give the space, sociopolitical space, uh, whole space, I think is expression in English, no? for those issues around um, uh, the way in which not only things that are specific to the sculptors, but also how to rule in our contemporary life, because people from, from elsewhere can have something to say about us that perhaps we are not aware. No? So I feel like sometimes not necessarily to to rebuild on certain niches around certain indigenous culture, certain tradition-based culture, but to allow for those epistemologies to live with those others that we uh, we have been training on. No? So if it's something we need to unlearn, some, some um, Western processes of knowledge uh, to allow them to be more permeable to these other cultures. Thank you so much. Um, Jessica, is there something you want to add to that? Obviously, it was one of your conclusions also for this 2020, uh, after the 2020 summit, that we need to learn from indigenous cultures more. Yes, I was thinking actually in response to both questions um, about this incredibly uh, rich notion of proximity that Brian Stevenson from the Equal Justice Initiative speaks about so often. And I think, you know, it's about the humility. I, I think Carolina spoke about this, the idea of being, um, you know, being the helper on your block, being the person on your block, allowing yourself to be proximus, uh, having the, 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 yes, the humility, the, the openness, porousness, as, as Elvira is saying, um, that allows you uh, to completely readjust, you know, I mean, as, as Andrea is saying, I mean, these, these shifts, but, but I think this idea of proximity is such a powerful one, because in reality, that is not most of our lived lives. We live, and even more so now that we're in this virtual territory, I think um, there's the extreme danger actually of people settling into their very familiar, um, confined socioeconomic lives. Um, so how do we hold on to this idea and, and, and um, uh, commit to it really? Yeah, I just wanna say, I think it's so important to find movements and organizations locally that address these issues and pick one organization and get involved with it you know and and then i think i think that can change everything i really believe in the local in terms of movement building and change and then i think over time that affects the global but i it's a really simple step and you know i think there's so many different ways within different organizations pick something that's like you're passionate about and get involved in that organization just reach out to them i mean we've all we're all online all the time <laughs> now you can find you know a group and get involved and it's it's a you know it's i think that's one of the ways you get out of that 
that space you're talking about, Jessica. Definitely. I mean, it's, it's something that um, Patrice Colors talks about all the time. Yeah, I thought it was beautiful how you said, Carolina, uh, indeed, be good to your neighbor, to the people in your block. And we've been, again, getting so much comments and feedback uh, from people today at the, at the Virtual Art Summit. I'm going to do this. I'm also going to help. So that is truly inspiring. We have another question from Simona Quaglia. Sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly. How can indigenous art become free of the categorization of art artisanal and become part of the contemporary art scene? Hmm. I, and think, I think it's part of the contemporary art scene. Um, I mean, more and more you see indigenous curators, indigenous critics, indigenous contemporary artists share in the scene. So I think, I think we're already there. Um, and um, it, it's up to us now to up uplift, to spotlight, to highlight that presence and, um, you know, and to relearn like how Andrea says, but I, I think, you know, the, the indigenous presses in contemporary art is, is every time is, you know, is, is getting stronger and it's definitely part of the, the narrative right now. I mean, I feel like in the, I can only speak for the US, you know, cause that's, you know, but I, I feel like it is happening. Like Carolina is saying my, you know, my hope is that as these artists enter the system, they help change the system because the system is problematic. You know, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's, it's a very problematic capitalist system. So let's help new ideas come and make some great change as this is happening. I think that I, I want to see more indigenous artists showing and having a voice, but I'd like to see system change in that process. I think that what, what you had just said, Andrea, is a, is a very crucial aspect, no? Because I think, and, and, and this can be also problematic because we are asking, uh, I say this uh, for indigenous uh, culture, but uh, for indigenous art, but it happened that the same with African art not so long ago, no? Like that we are asking double the, the, the effort to all those um, uh, artworks uh, when they enter in a collection or to these artists, you know, the burden of representation is exquisitely heavy in, in certain artists that see two things, you know, their own bio autobiography almost as an, another object to sell. And also the fact that many people consider their, their origins, the cultural identity and the, and the um, and the geographic provenance as a, almost as an aesthetic category. And I think that is problematic. One way that you need to empower the, the art in these communities, as Carolina was saying, is that it's admitting that it was there, that the, the problem is the framework, not necessarily the, what is, is yet to be framed, that they, there are issues that in a way had to do with understanding the complexity, the, the poetics, the histories that surround those practices in order to then um, have their place, their rightful place in an art history that before had overlooked them. But it's not about, it's an effort that has to do, as Andrea and Carolina were saying, the framework has to do it. The agents that are addressing this has to do it. And perhaps at a certain moment, the indigeneity shouldn't be the only thing that those words bring to the conversation. It should be about other aspects of their aesthetic altogether, about how they engage with the world, with the politics of the moment, etc. And then, of course, yes, it happened that it also represent indigenous practice, First Nation practice, uh, tradition base of the people of, I don't know, the Kilimanjaro. But, it, but the most important thing is that it moves us at an aesthetic level, that it, it challenges a sociopolitical level. I think that just just briefly, I would say that this, this is reminding me so much of this amazing talk by Adrian LaHood last year and this incredible painting that was actually used as a document in a legal case. But of course, it was an artwork. It was a collective artwork. It was something that was documenting 
um, the landscape that belonged to these different Aboriginal peoples, but the the activism of it, the the sort of questioning of what an art object is, completely transforming um, the notion of everything from its production to its placement to its status to its use value. I, I just thought that was, yeah, that in, in a way that sort of summarizes all these changes that you're that you're pointing to in a way, you know. This, the structure of the art world, though, right, is is capitalism, and it's you know the struggle for artistic autonomy is real, and you know I want to see the system change rather than to see you know just more diversity but still under control and manipulation of the same system where artists are struggling so hard for autonomy and i think that model you give is one that is autonomous but i think it's super rare especially where i'm at right because the system is one of you know you showing galleries and then maybe you showing museums and collectors buy your work but then maybe your work goes to auction like that whole system is is hard and scary, I think, sometimes. So I, I, I think it's more systemic change, I hope, comes mm -hmm. from the voices of, you know, of, from like, you know, indigenous peoples and, you know, artists of color and trans folks and everybody, like, we've got to change this bigger system. I think that's a beautiful quote to end this fabulous panel. Uh, thank you all so much, Carolina, Elvira, Andrea and Jessica for your ongoing support of our platform. Really appreciate. And thank you all for watching and for joining us on this first day of the Virtual Verbia Art Summit. We'll be back tomorrow with a full program, uh, but you can also watch us live at 11 a.m. We'll kick off with a talk by Naina Terena. Thank you for watching.